and welcome to Early Years TV with me, Cathy Brody. Today is all about the kinetic chain of children's development and motor sensory integration. And I'm just delighted and thrilled to be joined today by Charlotte Davies. Charlotte is the director of the company Fit to Learn. She originally trained in finance, but then moved into teaching when working in the Far East. She holds a national professional qualification for head teachers and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Through Darlene Smith, she came to understand the link between child development and cognitive skills. In 2012, she founded fit to learn and subsequently trained as a tomatist or a tomatis consultant. In 2016, she won the prize for the best case study at the Tomatis Paris Convention and in 2018, co-authored an excellent book, which I will put links to folks, The Maze of Learning, Developing Motor Skills, which she co-authored with uh, Melina Healy and Darlene Smith. A very, very warm welcome to Early Years TV, Charlotte Davies. Thank you very much for inviting me and it's a real pleasure to chat to you this afternoon. Yeah, well, you're very welcome. This is, I mean, this is, I have to put a caveat before we even start. Even though this is an extended session, we are only going to be touching on some bits. So let's start off with the very, very basics. Let's start at that beginning. What is it that we actually mean by senses? So we mean all the senses, but Sound is your first myelinated sense. It's a sense that's already working before you're born and it triggers a lot of other senses. So when you you start using your sound, you by reflex, your motor skills start working. Once you start using sound and motor skills, you're starting to use your sense of proprioception where you are in space. You're also starting to use your eyes, linking your eyes to your limbs. So your vision is starting. But when we start, touch is so key, isn't it? And so children are picking things up and putting them in their mouths. They're touching all the time. And when I'm assessing people, if they're still using touch a lot, I know that their sound and their vision isn't working very well. If your sound and vision doesn't work very well, your senses can go haywire and you can overdevelop senses. So when my son was blinded when he was young, he developed echolocation and it took us years to get rid of it because his brain overdeveloped in the sound processing. So your senses have a definite sequence of development. They need to be balanced one with the other. If they're not, like you often see with older adult um, autistics with profound autism, they like smell a lot. They judge a lot by smell or some of them touch your artery to judge your sense they're using touch a lot but ideally what we're doing is moving from touch through sound to the point where vision is our dominant sense so by seven or eight years of age we don't have to touch everybody or everybody or anything we can actually imagine what it looks like in our mind's eye does that make sense yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm really intrigued that you've said age seven or eight, because we think about babies as already having a lot of the senses. Age seven or eight, they're at school already. So, I mean, that's really old. Yes. So children really are not ready to be in formal education until seven or eight. Big numbers, wow. because you haven't got postural control. So I was with a handwriting expert on Saturday and somebody else who claimed to be a handwriting expert. And the other person was talking about pressing down and you'll be pressing. And I was going, no, your spine supports all the weight. You're writing very gently. But actually what's happening is everybody's buckled up pressing down and everybody's dropped to one side with one eye. They're very badly developed. So there's a lot has to happen between four and seven to get somebody's posture working properly and the posture mapped to the whole body and the posture mapped to all your senses and what's called your bilateral integration in motor skills, your left and right working together. So you can go over your midline and there's no problem so that you can throw a ball from left to right. And we don't get lots of body movement. When you're that still, you understand left and right, you are ready to cross your midline. 
But before we came on this, I was looking at um, screenshots of teenagers. Every single one of them, when they go across the midline, is clamping up their jaw because it's such a strain. We get a lot of blinking going on because they can't go over their midline. And they're twisting their bodies one way or another. They can't draw a rhombus, a diamond shape. They're having to flick their eyes from left to right. They can't draw a Union Jack because they can't remember what it looks like, even though they've just seen it. So, and when they draw a circle, they might set off and then there's a little judder as they try and get the two ends of the, their line to join each other because they don't really know where the lines meet. Does that make sense? So between zero and seven, eight, you are getting individual senses and motor skills sorted, and then you're going to bring them all together to an integrated way. So when I was young, we'd all be in the playground doing patter cake, patter cake, baker's mud. So you're bringing sound and motor skills and rhythm together and lots of activities like that. During lockdown, I had a young man who was excluded from school and he was very motivated by the idea of making a rope swing. The whole process of learning how to swing on a rope swing in a big circle, bring his feet up to kick off from a tree and swing back 180 degrees, really involved all his motor skills, all his timing, all his ability to visualize what to do. And it really made him integrate his senses and motor skills. And he was much more grounded by the end of this activity. I was wrecked because I hadn't done it for 50 years, I would think at least. And he had no idea how to swing on a rope swing. He needed it modeling for him. And it never occurred to me I'd be doing that over 60. <laughs> so, but it's really important. All those activities, it's really important we're doing and children are not doing them. And you, COVID really emphasized that. So children came out post COVID and they hadn't moved and it magnified an already bad situation. So, yeah. you know. Just to play devil's advocate for a minute, though, children, when they are born, they do move. They, we don't have to teach them um, the sucking motion. We don't have to teach them some of those reflexes. Now, Just reflex, tell me about reflex. So as you come through the birth canal, ideally, that triggers your body to do things by reflex. So think, if you're sucking away habitually, it's a reflex action. That dribbling. You've got to get conscious control of your muscles. And it's incredibly important because if you don't have conscious control, you do not know where left and right are. The other sort of things can happen because you, a lot of children are missing the crawling stage at the moment, we're too sedentary, is you don't move your head backwards and forwards enough pre-crawling and your voice box is too high. So the voice box needs to drop and come to a better place. We need to be able, we're the only apes that can separate our head from our body. It's really, really important. As hunter-gatherers, we could run very long distances and look around us. That was very useful. As advanced humans, we can't get our eyes to cross the midline if we can't separate our head. So every line a child reads, if they haven't got this separation, their eyes jump. And that really disrupts their fluency of reading. Um, things like the spinal gland, the base of your spine, a baby by reflex, when you touch the base of the spine, they urinate and defecate. Very handy. If they didn't, they blow up. You <laughs> want them to empty. But when they, if they don't integrate it, and little Johnny arrives at school and he puts the base of his spine on the back of a chair, even if he's already been to the toilet, he will get an involuntary reaction. He wants to wriggle, can't stop wriggling. And so we're labeling them ADHD, but actually what's happened is he's still got this reflex down his spine. Get complete conscious control of the muscles, then 
All the muscles down the back of the spine will be equal. These reflexes that make people wriggle will cease. You have a very good conscious sense of left and right. You can separate your head and you get much, much better control of your eye muscles. Much better control. We're at the moment going through a massive doubling of myopia. People's eyes aren't working very well. And everyone goes, oh, it's the screens. It isn't just that. It's the primitive reflexes. You've got to have integrated your primitive reflexes to have really good control of your eye muscles. So these are really important building blocks. And were I running the government, every reception year group, you would do one primitive reflex every half term. Everybody would be doing it. And we would work our way through. The next year, year one, would teach the reception year. Because if you are thinking as a little year one, A, you think you're really important, but B, when you have to teach somebody else, you really get it into your head. You get very much better control of your own muscles and you're training the person in front of you. So the quality of learning is very much higher. It's much, much better integrated. And if it's been missed in the previous year, it can easily get picked up. And we ought to go on checking those because if you have a big trauma, you're taken into care, mum dies, they can come back. Oh, really? So, yes, women post-pregnancy ought to go through a programme of primitive reflexes just to pull their bodies back into a good place. And you get so much better control of your body, you feel much better. We ought to, as a society, do it to prevent old age. It really stops a lot of degeneration later on. Yeah, so it's, yeah. you know, you, when you change the five-year-old, you often change the whole family. Wow. That so, is so interesting. Yeah. yeah. And you said uh, there about some of the sort of the fidgeting, some of the other things that um, we might see if there are retained primitive reflexes. Are there any sort of major ones that you would say, this is like a core one, this is one that you've got to look out for? I get that. I'm at the moment screening large numbers of children and nearly all of them have retained primitive reflexes. So I think there are five primitive reflex exercises that you don't even bother checking do. In the, <laughs> because then, like with the spinal gland, if you do it, you get much better control of bladder and bowel. Yeah. Why bother having conversations about who's wetting the bed? Just do it. And then people go, oh, he's now so much better. And the things they wouldn't have told you, they were embarrassed about, we're now sorted. The only one I usually get mothers to do 100% is the, the work around the mouth, getting the rooting reflexes sorted, stroking them. But we really do need to go through spinal gland to make sure we've got bladder control and equal control of muscles in the back. We need to go through tonic labyrinth reflex to get a really strong core and so our eyes can focus and refocus. We need to go through the moro reflex to get our voice box to drop and to get our left and right sorted. We need to go through the asymmetric tonic neck reflex to get our head separated from our body and so our eyes can develop to track text and we need to know where the top or bottom halves of our body are and that's our symmetrical tonic neck reflex. Get those five done and give mum the video on rooting reflexes. And by and large, children, things are in place. And then they can get mastery of more complicated motor skills. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, the details of all those sorts of exercises and things that you can do for those primitive reflexes are in your book, aren't they? With yeah. details. They're in the book with details, but I'd also so go onto our YouTube channel because there I really go into the nitty gritty detail of things like the moral reflex where you're bringing in one side, then the other. Just all the tricks we use to make it work, because there's nothing more frustrating than you do 40 days of an exercise that hasn't quite worked. And then you have to do it better. But for another 40 days, it's soul destroying. So it's much better to realise this is the exercise we think will crack it the fastest. This is how to do it. And these are the tricks we use. 
It was like with spinal gland, I use weights. The more resistance the child experiences, the faster the exercise works, the better it is. It doesn't need to happen 10 million times for two hours a day. It needs to be five to 10 reps a day, every single day for 40 days, but done really well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I suggest to families when they're doing all of them, start with one, get up to the point you're doing it in three minutes, then pick up another one and so on. And just uh, take it up and celebrate because it is so soul destroying. I hated yeah. doing it myself with my son. And I, but when it's sorted, and like I was chased down the road this year by a mother who her child, you know, was a long time ago in our clutches. And the child is now on her way to Cambridge and she couldn't learn when we met them. You know. Oh, fabulous, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and the, what the mother kept saying is she can learn anything. Like, yeah, oh. that's the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> How absolutely amazing. Now that, that I mean, that is, makes everything worthwhile, doesn't it? As you say, they are very, um, I wouldn't say simple because that's not fair. They're, they're very straightforward things. Once you know why you're doing it and what you're doing, they're very straightforward. Um, but let me just take you back to something that you've said there as well. Those external influences, whether that's um, trauma or glue ear or th I mean, thing, life happens, doesn't it? So um, what can we do about those sorts of things? What things should we be looking out for as well, really? So you need to know that humans are actually going backwards developmentally and that's causing our faces to get flatter and that is causing a huge tsunami of modern illnesses. So 80% of modern Western children get inner ear infection. 80, 80, that is huge. So pretty much everybody I see has had inner ear infection and that has impacted on their sound processing. So you can do all the sensible things like sitting up. You can do all the sensible things like getting your nasal breathing working properly. So, and you can, and there's a video on nasal breathing, but all humans need to breathe nasally and a lot of children don't. And that causes delays and it causes really a whole global array of illnesses from heart conditions to obesity because the body's not working properly so we need to get them breathing properly we need to get their sound processing working and i am sorry but usually i like to give everybody everything for free but it's the one area where i think it's worth spending the money and i honestly don't think there's any point doing anything other than going for the best in the market because you're having to work with the tiny muscles in the inner ear to get them working but my goodness when somebody's sound processing works it is terribly exciting when they make a big shift and in the inner ear is your vestibular system and your vestibular system is your junction box between motor skills sound vision facial muscles everything comes together so if you want to socially engage you've got to have good sound processing and it all needs to work together with the rest of the body. So glue ear is a, a big problem and it's a big problem for most people. And we ought to have an early years sound processing program that encourages rhythm, that encourages a lot of speech and language, that encourages that I, I would put everybody through at least three rounds of sound therapy to get them to the point where their speech and language is very good like a really good choral scholar. Everybody ought to be able to sing in tune. Everybody ought to be able to learn their own language relatively easily and foreign languages. And we're just nowhere near that. If I go into a youth offending unit, every single youngster will be missing 70, 80 decibels of sound. And if we agitated the inner ear, they would change quite dramatically. I mean, that's i mean they're scary statistics aren't they and it's very very worrying as you said i think glue ear is so common every every setting has somebody with glue ear at any one time you know it's very yes. common yeah yeah to to get somebody to the point where it stops recurring they need to be upright the inner ear's got to drain so this postural control this very strong upright sitting is really important 
And I personally wouldn't have any chairs in any early year setting. I wouldn't have in secondary settings either. I want people so upright, they can sit upright. And if they want to stand up, their feet are flat on the floor and they can just raise themselves and lower themselves. They've got really, they naturally sit upright and their body is draining properly. And if they're lying on the sofa, it won't happen. So I have families sometimes come back to me, oh, he's still, you know, he keeps getting problems. His sound keeps going down. This isn't working. And then I find out the child spends 18 hours a day lying on the sofa. <laughs> uh, Humans aren't designed to do that. We're hunter-gatherers. We're designed to be out for very long hours and really only to go back to a house to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the other thing that um, the ear is associated with, of course, is a vestibular sense, isn't it? Yeah. So that's things that like your balance, your sense of acceleration, deceleration, your sense of space. Because if your sound isn't working well, your peripheral vision doesn't work well either. So you, everything closes down. So when you see your hoodies, they're telling you their peripheral vision is closed down. The sound, when you bring up the sound, often it just triggers the peripheral vision to come up as well. So it's all knitted together quite horribly. And when you're working with children who haven't got good facial muscles, getting the sound working properly, the facial muscles are linked to the vestibular system. It's about social engagement, understanding people. So getting the facial muscles working at the same time as getting the sound working helps people make sense of things, along with pitch differentiation. So if you think of somebody getting into trouble, if they can't really hear you, and when you do speak, they can't tell any difference in the intonation, and they can't make any sense of your facial movements, they soon learn that it's best to stay away from all dangerous grown-ups. And so yeah. you get, you know, I would say a lot of this knife crime is around <laughs> people who can't interpret anything and they're just going to violence as the easy option. You can really understand how there'd be that miscommunication as well if you had, and I'm thinking maybe of the older children now, but as an example, if you had somebody in authority saying to whether that's a head teacher or um, the police or, or whoever, saying something to them, they're unable to read the facial expression, they're unable to um, understand the words quickly enough, maybe. Uh, I mean, that you can understand why they get into trouble, can't you? That's right. And on top of that, when you are frightened, you naturally close your sound processing down. It's a reflex. You can't stop it. So, yeah, it's fascinating what the inner ear does. When you're working That's with true. children in care, they must be in a safe place before you start shunting them too much through the sound processing, because they will just throw off the headset by reflex. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you're forcing things open because as well as being the junction box, it's a good survival mechanism to close down your sound in your vestibular because you separate your senses so you're not feeling as much. Yeah, but yeah. It's survival. And of course, as you say as well, sometimes we see that in some of the children who have um, certain diagnoses. So I think a fairly um, something you would look out maybe for children who are possibly on the autistic spectrum are those that go and hide in the corner. That's very much the sort of thing that you would see that they are shutting down all those external stimulus, aren't they? Yes. And, well, they're overwhelmed because if you can't get things in context and you're in a inside a building, which is unnatural to humans. The sound is bouncing off the walls. Mm -hmm. So you're getting tremendous reverberation. If your visual system doesn't work, there's a fair chance you've got echolocation, which massively magnifies the reverberation. You don't know where your arms and legs are, because when I do angels in the snow assessments with youngsters and I tap a hand, I've got their eyes closed, they have to open their eyes and say, is it this hand you want me to move? because they don't know where their hands and legs are. So they really, there could be an out of space. Their sense of spatial awareness is so bad. So it's very, very frightening, which is until you get motor sensory integration, then you're very dependent on secure adults. You're very dependent on your attachments. 
once you've got motor sensory integration, well, the last thing you want is your parents around to catch you nicking all the chocolate or whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> go away. You, um, you, you start having a more exciting life. And you know where they are, but you can now go out on your bike or whatever, and you're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, does it work the other way as well? That um, because that, that's the motor integration. We're talking there about like the basic senses. Then, because the, they're quite complex things. I mean, obviously things like riding a bike or or running even, or or sitting still. They're very complex, aren't they? How does being able to do that affect? Does it go back the other way as well? So you can't run properly if you haven't got your primitive reflexes. So I was walking through a park yesterday and I saw this young adult running along and it was all I could do to stop myself being an interfering old bat saying, stop dear, <laughs> you're going to be in terrible pain. But, you know, 40 days, I could have your motor skills a lot better aligned. Yeah. So it has to go in developmental order, in order. So I can see our leading tennis players in the UK. I can see Emma Raducanu when she goes over her midline, her jaw clamps up. I can see Andy Murray runs like this. And because he's not running forwards and backwards, it's what's damaged his hips. Oh, wow. That is incredible. Yes, because our sports professionals do not understand primitive reflexes. They don't understand how sound impacts on the body. And they don't know how to bring together motor skill, sound and vision. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the other thing there as well, you're talking about clenching the jaw and having that tenseness as well. I mean, we're then moving not only into physical development, but we're also talking there about well-being, about and children need to be relaxed to learn. We know that. That's that's just there. So um, if, if you are clenched and you're tense, you're not going to learn either, are you? No, and you've got a lot of nerves down the side of your face, which are running from head and neck. From, from brain to body and vice versa. It's really important that your jaw is relaxed. So if you have a tense jaw, that's going to trigger off tinnitus, migraines, and in extremis, that's what Tourette's is about. So I can give you a video link where you can see where they change the position of the jaw and take the pressure off the nerves, the Tourette stops. Oh, wow. And you imagine going through life with Tourette's. It is, <laughs> yeah. It's exhausting. And the same with tinnitus as migraines, but actually getting this all to work so we are literally really beautifully aligned, that ought to be such an important goal for education because you are you're going to be physically fitter, mentally fitter, and you're going to be a lot smarter for life. What is really important for people to understand is once you've got the physical going, you've got to get the brain involved. So it's yeah. not good enough just to have sorted out the primitive reflexes. It's not good enough to have got two eyes working together and the sound processing working. You've got to do things. If you don't do things, you don't develop the intellect. So I just happen to have to hand an exciting little puzzle. But things like copying pattern are really important. So you're using your eyes, you're playing around with shapes, you're going across your midline, you're copying patterns. And you start with simple patterns and you build up. Because ultimately, being able to see patterns, see relevant from irrelevant, is about the most important skill we need. And yet we don't teach it. No. We take the munchkins and we start testing them on times tables. Yeah. And we, we're just saying one, two, is two, two, two is a four. And what they're doing is they're going through their sound processing system. They're not using their visual or integrated senses. So we're not getting them to the point where they can see a simple pattern and then a bigger one. And then we get up to the 10 by 10, which is a pretty big pattern. But when I think of tables, I can see the pattern and the shape the number pattern makes on any block of 100 squared numbers. I would know that pattern of numbers anywhere in the number system, whether we're up in the tens of thousands or whatever. I know that's the pattern of the seven times table or the five or whatever. 
But our children don't. They're kind of going, one five side, two five side. They're, they're not bringing their senses together, building up cognitive skills, and then able to apply them. And the same with musical skills, the same with language skills. We're rushing them. So um, before we read and write, we need to have good rhythm. We need to be able to process all the sounds of the English language. We need to be able to say them. If we can't say them, we can't sound process them. And guess what? We don't process all the sounds of the English language until seven, because as our posture comes up, our sound processing changes. So you just think about those early years classes where they're flashing phonics cards. Nobody has matched that phonics system to what humans actually sound process. <laughs> Unbelievably, as you say, yes, most definitely. But it also be awful. It also explains why a lot of those systems don't actually work, doesn't it? So I mean, and, but they cause stress because the little children are sitting there; they actually can't focus in the near range anyway. So they're using one or the other. There'll be some smart girl in the class who can do it, but everybody else is. And everyone's using coping strategies. Coping strategies is bad learning. We'd be much better off spending a lot of time on very simple things, but getting them really right. And then at seven, eight, moving on to much higher levels of learning. And we'd be moving very quickly. But what we're doing is then the children are damaged and they're still very slow learners. And a certain percentage of them, we know at four, that's it, 25% are not going to get five GCSEs. Well, if we know it at four, let's stop doing what we're doing. <laughs> and actually make them fit to learn. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I know in the book you talk about things um, like nursery rhymes. And again, I yeah. think that's very straightforward, isn't it? Yeah, but in fact, a lot of people don't know them. And a lot of people... Um, if you've got parents who have got sound processing problems, they won't be able to enunciate them clearly. So doing lots with different people and building up your speech and language is important because you model your speech on your mother tongue. And if your mother tongue isn't English or it isn't, or it's a bit slurred, you're gonna have difficulty. So it's quite important children get time in the early years to do a lot of rhythmic language work. And I mean lots, but they are super programmed once you've taught them a rhyme to go into the playground and teach it to everyone else. So our experience is that we tried to run a scientific trial with two groups. and One was delayed so we could show the difference between the two groups. And we taught them each peach, pear, plum, I spy Tom thumb, the whole book. Group A were pretty good. Group B would be on brilliant because Group A had taught them everything in the playground and the day <laughs> they arrived, they were worked perfect. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no, they were fantastic because Group A were willing, had more time to put into it in the playground than we had in our once a week session. And now I say to schools, get Class A to learn one book, class B to learn the other, and they can do it in the playground. They get rhythm, they get vocabulary, they enjoy it. They've got some personal agency, and they're all enjoying inventing different mad clapping activities with it. So it's, it's really a good thing to do, but they need to be really building vocabulary and a real sense of what the words mean. At the moment, we're doing a puzzle a lot with older children showing that to be honest the phonics has been a disaster we throw up the top 10 letters in the English alphabet we don't let them touch them they've got to tell us how many words they can make they can't maybe they they're having to think oh what words do I know then they're checking can they spell it I can look at those letters and I can spell I don't know 500 words I'm typing down at the moment children who can maybe spell four. Wow. Yeah. yeah. They're not functional learners. Yeah. 
because we haven't got every single bit of the early years in place. Yeah. I think that's very similar to what I'm hearing about the maths as well, that they're not able to subitize, so they're not able to look at a number of dots on a dice and say that's five or that's four without having to go, right, it's one, two, three. Mm -hmm. But they can't just look and make understanding of what they're seeing within their brain and come up with a number. Because you can't visually learn if your motor skills and sound don't work. Yes. And we're not checking that the two eyes work together. We're checking one eye works 20 feet away and the other eye works 20 feet away. Yeah. That's what they've checked. What you really need to know for learning is can you focus in the near range? Because you're not learning most of the time 20 feet away. <laughs> you're here and you need to focus and refocus. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that's another thing as well, isn't it? All of our desks are flat. And yet we know from research that a 22 degree angle is much better. Yes. And we've known that since the 1940s. And we know that if you've got a flat desk, even if everything else is in place, you're going to strain the vision. And so Harmon's work showed that 20% of children would come into school with visual problems. And after five years of the flat desks, the, di the dire school environments, you were 80% of children with visual impairment. And yeah, yeah no, it, it is pretty tragic. So, so much of the school furniture, you know, be it the plastic chairs where they're all sitting there, or the tables where, to begin with, they're peeping over, and all their two, you know, they're just not well designed. But I had 22 degree angled desks. I'm old enough to remember them. They were lovely. And they were thrown out because they weren't seen as modern and replaced by much cheaper furniture. Ooh. So no, we, I think the other thing is things like lighting, making sure we've got nice quality lighting in schools that's just clear and people can see and one of the other things you want to be aware of is if a child is sitting all year at one angle to the board, they will strain their vision. They need to have both eyes working equally. Because if you're spending all year turning, your eyes will get unbalanced. So we need to be doing some quite simple eye exercises, maintaining balanced eyes, but also being square to what we're working with. Yeah, yeah. So what would your eye exercises be? Oh, very simple. <laughs> so with particularly early years, I would just get them to hold their heads and look around the room. And if they're not of, too nervous, I'd tell them there's a tiger in the room and to look <laughs> around and look for the tiger. But whatever they do, they mustn't move or the tiger will eat them. And then eventually I pounce, of course, which they like. And then they want to play it again. So just a stupid game where they get to move their eyes widely, looking for the tiger. I, when am I going to pounce and go roar and you know, jump on some unsuspecting child? They enjoy that so much, they want to play it over and over and move their eyes. Yeah, and you're just, that. particularly early years, you're getting them to move their eyes separately to their head. Once they get a bit older, you want their eyes going, well, you want them to be able to wink with both eyes. You want them to be able to squeeze their eyes closed and open them really wide. You want them to be able to take their eyes to one side and then the other, and up to the ceiling, down to the floor, all without moving their eyes, going in big circles one way, big circles the other, and a thing called clocking, where they keep their head still, they look at the middle, and they go out to the one and then come back to the middle and go out to two and back to the middle and out to three and so on. So you're taking the eye muscles on diagonals. And the general idea is to exercise the eyes. If you've got a child in the class who's got one eye that's peculiarly wonky, then work with one eye at a time to make sure each eye does the work. But whatever you do with one eye, always do with the other. Because the eye, you've eventually got to get to the point where they've got equally strong eyes. But, you know, we've had children with terrible, like, nystagmus. And we've put one child with wonky eyes with the other. Mobile phones are very good. And they have to try and work out how to move each other's eyes. They'll work with one at a time. But 
while they're looking at the other child's eyes, they get better control of their own eyes. Yeah. And so the, the mirror neurons work very well. And then the nystagmus calms down and they learn to bring their eyes properly into focus. And then children with lazy eyes manage to bring their eyes in. And if the children are having difficulty explaining it, using the mobile phones to video each other's eyes is really good because then they can go, this is what's happening. Or they, the nice thing is they like to show how things have improved. I cross. But it's, it, it's the only way you can communicate because, of course, you can't see what your own eyes are doing. <laughs> Yes, that, that's a definite problem. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I love that some of the things you've got, the ac other activities you've got in the book as well, are children working together. And one which yeah. I really liked and I want to try is um, where you have them picking up things with their toes, scrunching their toes. Just tell me a bit about that one. Well, if between four and seven, your arches need to rise. If your arches don't rise, then your posture can't work properly. So making sure every child's feet arches rise should be a key objective. So we need to do exercises with our feet. But of course, exercising your feet is a bit boring. So doing things like picking things up with your feet and throwing them and see who can throw things the furthest. Or we came up with a one called beanbag wrestling, which works, to be honest, better with an adult and a child because you can pretend you're having more difficulty. But the child has to pick up the beanbag with their toes and bring the beanbag under their toes and then hang on for dear life with onto the beanbag while the other person is pulling it. And that makes them use the muscles in their feet, which they find quite exciting if it's a really stupid game, in order to get them moving. One of the things we, we see a lot of in Britain is the child's lower leg, ankles and feet are absolutely solid. And we have to massage the lower leg and ankles and feet, really warm them up and get the child to look at their feet and start to move them. And it might take us six months to get the feet and ankles working properly. So the more children can be in bare feet, the more they can use their feet and ankles, the better. If the child's arches aren't rising, we have an exercise called squash frog where the child's lying face down and their feet are turned out and they're pressing their heels to the floor. And that's really important because it turns the thighs to the right place with the hips. If the thighs don't turn to the right place with the hips, they're pressing down on the arches and the arches can't rise. Interesting. And, and so, so what's your diagram of it? Yes, yes, please do. So what sort of age would you say that the arches have actually got to be in the right place then? Under sort by, of... by seven, they should be there. By so seven. between four and seven, there's this really important piece of development going on. There's a lot of important development going on. But with the feet, we should definitely be checking them. And we, we should be checking we've got to a heel to toe gait and the children are toe walkers. Because one of the problems with toe walking is that the bottom sticks out too far. Yeah. When the bottom sticks out far, one of the things I've really noticed with hyper alert children is it seems to compromise their sensory system and make them even more hyper alert. When the hips come to the right place with the spine and the thighs, the person's sensory system seems to work much better. Yeah, well, that so absolutely it, makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, because you're not you haven't got all your nerves in your spine under massive pressure. And particularly if you get your moral reflex sorted as well, when I've got selective mutes, very common, I've got to sort out the hips, sort out the throat, oh, mom, the selective mutism stops. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because if your moral reflex is too high, you already feel like you're being strangled. Yeah. So if you're nervous in school, you feel a bit tense, that's it, you're not going to speak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because certainly when I've spoken to people about selective mutism, they say that, it, you know, it's often thought of as an, an anxiety disorder. It can cause anxiety, but it's not actually that. It is just something where they feel they can't move their throat and that they are unable to speak, which is often how it's described. But that would absolutely make sense. That would be the reason why, wouldn't it? That's right. It's your moral reflex, but also every single selective mute I've seen also has the hips in the wrong place. 
bringing wow. the two into, and even when I'm working with the adults who are hyper alert, bringing the hips into alignment does reduce anxiety quite dramatically. Yeah. yeah so yeah. getting people into a good, very straight line makes the nervous system work much better the, the whole gut etc and so on is much better stretched yeah, and, yeah. and of course the other thing that i've certainly done with children i've seen um done on various tests and things is to have them stand on one leg as well yes well what you're looking at when you get them stand on one leg is you're saying well has the child got core strength have yeah. they got balance you don't really know without other checks what it is that's causing them to wobble and fall over. But you know there is a problem with the vestibular integration, the balance and the core strength. And one of one or the other. So if you do a few more tests, you can work it out. But for instance, what I call quick and dirty screening in schools, we simply are saying to children who are seven plus, can you skip forwards and backwards? Can you stand on one leg for 30 seconds? If they can't move with opposite arm and leg really well, backwards and forwards skipping and stand on one leg, there is a problem. Go and do all the primitive reflexes. We should then be able to get you to a point where those problems disappear. And the way, because it's incremental development, sometimes you move one set of muscles or whatever, and then something else pops up and you go, oh, <laughs> we missed that before but never mind we'll sort that out now because you know you want to get the whole of the thing into a nice alignment absolutely i mean that and that's the thing obviously children develop all the time and it's a very very complex system as we've said there there's all sorts of external factors as well as everything else which would be considered typical development um there's loads and loads and loads to think about um as a system coming together um, you've mentioned there a few times that you do do screening. So tell us a little bit about the um, Tomatis um, approach. What is it that you do? Just take us through it, please, Charlotte. So if you're seven years plus, then I can have a really good look at how your sound works. And I'll be trying to persuade you to put on some headphones. And first of all, I can test you for how you process sound through air, because we're land-based animals. But air is quite a slow form of sound therapy, sound processing. So once I've checked how the air works, the other thing I look at is how you process through your skeleton, your bones. And the two systems have to work together. And it's only really since the 1960s that it's been understood that bone and air conduction of sound need to work together coherently. And the chap who identified this was Dr. Alfred Tomatis in France, who realized that living humans don't just process through air and that the system is not um, symmetrical, that you need to be right ear dominant ideally so that your left side of your brain can process speech more quickly. So you go from right ear to left brain and that's your speech processing center. The, they were now understanding, because we now understand more about neurology, that the left ear also plays a role in social engagement. So that when you're watching politicians, I would look at how far they talk off to the right or the left, and you'll understand how much they're socially engaged or not, even chief inspectors of schools. Anyway, so when I screen them, I'm looking, do they know which side the sound is on? So their directionality of sound. So if somebody is really autistic, then I'd expect on air conduction to be tremendous confusion. Some children classified as ADHD have a lot of confusion on sound processing on air, but not always. And I'm looking for the bone conduction air to be running 10 decibels below the air. But if it clashes, then when you're hearing the sound, the bone is crashing with the air conduction of sound. So I'm saying, you know, how are you, Billy? And what you're getting is, <laughs> Billy? <laughs> and I need to know you can tell the difference between pitch, so you can make sense of the nuances of language. And I need to know you can follow sound when it moves. Because if I set off moving around the classroom, and you can't follow sound when it moves, 
you are going to be back to <laughs> Billy. <laughs> so I look at all of these. I look at if there's a nasty dip, which might be caused by infection originally, but it's particularly once you hit adolescence and adult can cause big mental health problems. So when I get a very nasty dip in cell processing, I want to get it up so I've got a nice curve, a nice arc, because otherwise the person has no understanding why they're getting depressed or they're sobbing in bed or whatever. The sound processing changes, their mental health changes. And um, the sound processing in the lower cells, the deeper cells, your posture has a tremendous impact on it. You can move the sound processing often just by improving posture. Conversely, if you won't improve your posture, there is a limit to what I can do with sound therapy. But if we get motor skills and sound therapy working together, we get these big jumps, which are very exciting. And the other business is around sort of 5,000 hertz, humans naturally get very, very happy with music. I want to sing a dance. Do, 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 do. So just um, having a look at what's happening in that area, you can make, you can improve it, you can make people more joyous. Um, and you can, what I do, fix my headphones, is I can change people's sound processing by using very well calibrated therapy. So I have some specialist music and it's really important. It's been very, very well tested over decades. And it's two bands of music and it moves erratically from one band to the other. Same music, one's got the top notes taken off, one's got the bottom notes taken off. But it just wakes your brain up and then your muscles in the inner ear work first on bone conduction, then on air. And then it changes band of music. On your headphones, you're getting sound in the earmuffs through air. But in here is the really clever bit of technology. I know because being ex we stripped it down to have a good look. <laughs> um, this is the bone conducting and that you're you're getting the sound coming through bone conduction, you're getting it coming through air. And the, the impact is what really shifts the muscles in the inner ear, gets the vestibular working. And when things are going well, you get tremendously quick changes. If somebody's got really glued up ears, it might take rather long, longer. But, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, how, how quick would you say quick? Are we talking sort of weeks and weeks? No. So... Quick is when somebody phones me on day five crying because their child has spoken to them for the first time. Quick is I've mm -hmm. gone up, seen a child who's missing 70, 80 decibels. It looks like a snowstorm, their sound processing. And I come back 14 days later and the child is just a different person. So that, that is 14 days, first round of sound therapy. They've changed. And you're thinking, wow. And the person tends, the parent, whoever's whoever's doing it, tends to be diligent. They, they're doing 80 minutes or they're doing it in 40 minutes and 40 minutes. They're not doing a minute here and a minute there. They're doing nice big tranches and that gets the inner ear working. So I've got a primary school I went into, did an inset to the staff, everything, you know, Inset your day to sleep. We could be preparing. We've got a million to one of better things to do. Came back two weeks later. Everyone stopped me at the corridor. Go, my goodness, have you seen? You know, and because some of the children have changed so significantly, then it gets exciting. And yeah. I'm working. I'm doing a study with Leeds Beckett University in a couple of schools on the Wirral. Same thing with teenagers. The people are stopping me. Go, wow. You know, he's actually functioning in lessons where, you know, there's zero functioning before. Yeah. So it's that. Whereas sometimes children who are seen as autistic, it might take me two years to get their sound working, such as their speech is on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just depends how plastic that inner ear is, whether it's got absolutely gridlocked with garbage. Yeah, yeah. How exciting, though, to be able to see changes that quick. That would be yes. absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, literally mind-blowing. And let me just take you back to something there as well that I think I read in the book, that 
um, you have to do all the exercises, not just the ones that you like doing, because it is a, um, a the book and, and obviously the therapy, it is a balanced thing, isn't it? Yes, because your motor skills and your posture support the development of vision and sound. If you haven't got your midline crossing, you're clamping up around here and blocking everything. When your sound improves, your posture improves. When your sound improves, your vision and motor skills. So I used to wear glasses in tint. I got rid of my glasses by doing sound therapy and eye exercises and also having to teach everybody all these other exercises. But, you know, I literally went from being short-sighted, not being able to drive without my glasses or function to I just don't need them. And my night vision, which I never had, it was like driving in a black bin bag. Well, now... <laughs> You know, it's a black and white photograph and the world is brighter and sharper. It's more 3D. So anybody of any age could do the exercises. And it's quite fascinating because I was wearing some wearable tech and just testing it. And I just drove and sang my way to Oxford and back when I was living in Croydon. So it was four hours of overdosing on this wearable tech. And the next day I woke up and my vision was dramatically different. That is incredible. That is, I, I'm willing to take that challenge. That is just amazing. Wow. So do the primitive reflex exercises, do the eye exercises, and do some sound therapy. And it is quite interesting the effect of, if nothing else, you'll feel fab. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there is no downside, is there? No, it's not really? like um, laser correction where it might go wrong or something. That's uh, There is no downside, is there? How no, fantastic. No. If you think about exercising eyes, you're oxygenating your eyes, you're preventing macular degeneration. So yeah. the more you move your body, the better it gets. So no, it's all good stuff. Uh, absolutely. So the only other question then is, where can we find out more? Where are you? So I've just cleaned up my website, which I'm not exactly the world's best marketeer. So I'm at www.fit, F-I-T hyphen, number two, hyphen, learn, L-E-A-R-N dot com. Also, I'm on YouTube. If you look for fit to learn, then I go through. And in fact, on the website, there's an index which makes it easier to the YouTube videos. And as you said, there is the exciting book. And if you go onto the Tomatis website and you're looking for a UK sound therapist, you can find me there. And yes, you know, and people have been known to turn up by my doorstep. They have no <laughs> money, but my child is in this state and I'm desperate. And I've just said, yes, yes. okay, well, here's the tea. Let's try and sort out the problem. Oh, how wonderful. Yes, I'm not going to recommend that for everybody, no. but certainly everybody can go and have a look at the website and I will make sure yes. that all those links to the YouTube. And of course, you have a TED Talk as well. Yes. It's all designed so that at the lowest cost possible, you can get yourself and your children through good development. And your Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, so yes, absolutely. Yes. And, and the presenters as well. Um, and of course, you can get the book on Amazon and you can download that both as a Kindle and there's a hard copy as well, isn't there? Well, from Amazon, you can get a Kindle copy. You have to send us an email, I think, or you can press on the PayPal button on the website to get the book. Right, I'll make sure that those those links are all there. Well, yeah. Charlotte, uh, absolutely, I'm so, so pleased that you managed to find time to come and talk to us today. I'm just okay. delighted. I mean, there's so much more to read. I've done loads of reading. You've got loads of videos. There's loads and loads of research out there. It is all backed by research. It's all there. Um, and tons of links in the books as well. So um, do go and have a look at that. Uh, but for a minute, thank you so, so much for coming on to Early Years TV and discussing all about sensory motor integration. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. And look forward to seeing your glasses disappearing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I look forward to welcoming everybody to the next session on Early Years TV.